Good evening and welcome to Postmark Filmworks series, Our Bridges, Stories from When. I'm your host, Deborah Catherine. I'm an artist in Campbell County and a board member of Postmark. Our format for this series begins with a short reading from literature. Tonight's selection is from A Pioneer Mother a monograph written by Hamlin Garland, copyrighted by the author, and first published in the year 1922 by the Torch Press in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Our author, Hannibal Hamlin Garland, an American novelist, poet, essayist, short story writer, and psychical researcher. He's best known for his fiction involving hardworking farmers. He also worked as a teacher and lecturer. He was born September 14, 1860 on a farm near West Salem, Wisconsin, the second of four children. He died March 4, 1940. He was named after Hannibal Hamlin, the vice president under Abraham Lincoln. Our author's father was a volunteer in the Army of the Tennessee. Garland lived on various farms throughout his young life and later traveled widely, settling in Boston, Massachusetts in 1884 to pursue a career in writing. His first major success was a travel book and then a serialized biography of Ulysses S. Grant. Garland won a Pulitzer Prize in 1922 for biography and wrote a series of memoirs based on his diary. He became well known in his lifetime and had friends in literary circles. Interestingly, he moved to Hollywood, California in 1929 and became fascinated with psychic phenomena and tried to prove the legitimacy of psychic mediums. A friend, Lee Shippey, a columnist for the Los Angeles Times, recalled Garland's regular system of writing. He got up at half past five, brewed a pot of coffee, and made toast on an electric gadget in his study and was at work by six. At nine o'clock, he was through with work for the day. 
Then he breakfasted, read the morning paper, and attended to his personal mail. After luncheon, he and Mrs. Garland would take a long drive. Sometimes they would drop in on Will Rogers, or Will Durant, Robert Benchley, or even on me, for their range of friends was very wide. After dinner, they would go to a show if an exceptionally good one were in town. Otherwise, one of their daughters would read aloud. Garland died at age 79 at his home in Hollywood. Let us begin. A pioneer mother. She was neither witty nor learned in books, nor wise in the ways of the world. But I contend that her life was noble. There was something in her unconscious heroism which transcends wisdom. And now that her life is rounded into the silence whence it came, its significance and wisdom appears. To me, she was never young, for I am her son. And as I first remember her, she was a large, handsome, smiling woman, deft and powerful of movement, sweet and cheery of smile and voice. She played the violin then, and I recall how she used to lull me to sleep at night with simple tunes like Money Musk and Dan Tucker. She sang too, and I remember her clear soprano rising out of the singing of the Sunday congregation at the schoolhouse with thrilling sweetness and charm. Her hair was dark, her eyes brown, her skin fair, and her lips rested in lines of laughter. Her first home was in Green's Cooley in La Crosse County, Wisconsin, and was only a rude little cabin with three rooms and a garret. The windows of the house overlooked a meadow and a low range of wooded hills to the east. In this house, she lived alone during the two years of the Civil War while my father went as a volunteer into the Army of the Tennessee. Though my mother worked hard, she had time to visit with the neighbors and often took her children with her to quilting bees, which they enjoyed, for they could play beneath the quilt as if it were a tent and run under it for shelter from imaginary storms. My father's return from the war brought solace and happiness, but increased her labors, for he set to work with new zeal to widen his acres of plow land. I have the sweetest recollections of my mother's desire to make us happy each Christmas time. And to this end, she planned jokes for herself and little surprises for us. We were desperately poor in those days, for my father was breaking the tough sod of the natural meadows and grubbing away trees from the hillside, opening a farm, as he called it. And there was hardly enough extra money to fill three stockings with presents. I could see now that she was only a big, handsome girl, but she was my mother, and as such, seemed an old person. Her physical strength was very great. I have heard my father say that at the time he went away to war, she was his equal in many contests, and I know she was very deft and skillful in her work. She could cut and fit and finish the calico dress purchased in the morning of the same day. She cooked with the same adroitness, and though her means were meager, everything she made tasted good. She liked nothing better than to have her neighbors drop in to tea or dinner. After all, I do not remember very much of her life while in Winnesheek County, Iowa, where to we moved in 1869. She remained of the same physical dignity to me, and though she grew rapidly heavier and older, I did not realize it. My second sister, Jessie, came to us 
while living in an old log house in a beautiful wood just west of Hesper. And I now know that my mother never recovered from the travail of this birth. Though she returned to her domestic duties as before, and was to her children the jolly personality she had always been. While living on this farm, smallpox came to our family, and we were all smitten with this much dreaded disease. But mother not only nursed her baby and took care of us all, but she also smiled down into our faces without apparent anxiety, though some of us lay at death's door for weeks. Shortly after we recovered from this, we moved again. I don't know what her feelings were about these constant removals, but I suspect now that each new migration was a greater hardship than those which preceded it. My father's adventurous and restless spirit was never satisfied. The sunset land always allured him, and my mother, being of those who follow their husband's feet without complaining word, seemed always ready to take up the trail. With the blindness of youth and the spirit of seeking which I inherited, I saw no tear on my mother's face. I inferred that she too was eager and exalted at the thought of going west. I now see that she must have suffered each time the bitter pangs of doubt and unrest which strike through the woman's heart when called upon to leave her snug, safe fire for a ruder cabin in strange lands. She had four children at this time, and I fear her boys gave her considerable trouble. But her eldest daughter was of growing service in working about the house as well as in tending the fair-haired baby. But work grew harder and harder. My father purchased some wild land in Mitchell County, Iowa, and we all set to work to break the sod for the third time. A large part of the hardship involved in this fell upon my mother, for the farm required a great many hands, and these hands had enormous appetites, and the household duties grew more unrelenting from year to year. Our new house was a small one with but three rooms below and two above but it had a little lean-to which served as a summer kitchen. It was a bare home with no touch of grace other than that given by my mother's cheery presence. Her own room was small and crowded, but as she never found time to occupy it save to sleep, I hope it did not trouble her as it does me now as I look back at it. Each year, as our tilled acres grew, Churning and washing and cooking became harder, until at last it was borne in upon my boyish mind that my mother was condemned to never remitting labor. She was up in the morning, before the light cooking breakfast for us all, and she seldom went to bed before my father. She was not always well, and yet the work had to be done. We all worked in those days, even my little sister ran on errands, and perhaps this was the reason why we did not realize more fully the grinding weight of drudgery which fell on this pioneer's wife. We had plenty of good wholesome things to eat in those days, but our furniture remained poor. Our little sitting room was covered with a rag carpet which we children helped to make, tearing, sewing, and winding rags during the winter nights. I remember helping mother to dye them also, and in the spring she made her own soap. This also I helped to do. Churning and milking we boys did for her, and the old up and down churn was a dreaded beast to us, as it was to all the boys of the countryside. We had a clothes wringer and washer, and a barrel churn came along, and they helped a little, but work never lets up on a farm. There are always three meals to get and the dishes to wash, and each day is like another so far as duties are concerned. These were my happiest days, and I hope I carried something of my larger outlook back to my mother. 
I enjoyed mother's pies and donuts and self-rising bread, which enabled me to sustain life joyously from Monday morning till Friday night. She never seemed to tire of doing little things for my comfort, and I took them, I fear, with the carelessness of youth, never thinking of the pain they caused. I did not even perceive how swiftly she was growing old. She still shook with laughter over the tales of school life and sent me away each week with the products of her loving labor. She never expressed her deeper feelings. She seldom kissed her children, and after we grew to be boys of 12 or 14, she never embraced us. She still continued to threaten to trounce us, a menace which always provoked us to laughter. Mother's whippings don't last long, we used to say. Our home remained unchanged. The expense of opening a farm, of buying machinery and building barns, made it seem necessary to live in the same little story and a half house. The furniture grew shabbier, but was not replaced. My mother's dresses were always cheap and badly made, but so were the coats my father wore. Money seemed hard to hold even when the crops were good. I cannot recall a single beautiful thing about our house, not one. The sunlight and the songs of birds, the flame of winter snow, the blaze of snow crystals, I clearly call to mind. But the house I remember only as a warm shelter where my mother strove to feed and clothe us. But as nearly all other homes of the neighborhood were of like character, I don't suppose she realized her own poverty. At last, great change came to us all. The country was fairly filled with settlers, and my father's pioneer heart began to stir again. And once more he planned a flight into the wilder west. And in the fall of 1881, when I was 21 years of age, we parted company. I turned eastward, intent on further education. I mention this going especially because when it became certain that my people were leaving never to return, the neighbors thronged about the house one August day to say goodbye and with appropriate speeches presented mother with some silver and glassware. These were the first nice dishes she had ever owned, and she was too deeply touched to speak a word of thanks. But the givers did not take so much virtue to themselves. Some of them were women who had known the touch of my mother's hand in sickness and travail. Others had seen her close the eyes of their dead, for she had come to be a mother to every one who suffered. Those who brought the richest gifts considered them a poor return for her own unstinting helpfulness. I shall always remember that day. I was about to go forth into the world as our graduating orations had declared we should do. My people were again adventuring into strange lands, leaving the house they had built, the trees they had planted, and the friends they had drawn around them. The vid vivid autumnal sun was shining over all the lanes we had learned to love and sifting through the leaves of the trees that had grown up around us. The familiar faces of the bronzed and wrinkled old farmers were tremulous with emotion. The women frankly wept on each other's bosoms, and in the hush of that golden day, I heard the sound of wings, the wings of the death angel, whose other name is Time. I knew we would never return to this place, that the separation of friends there beginning would last forever. The future was luminous before me, but its forms were too vague to be delineated. I turned my face eastward, with a thought in my brain beating like the clock of the ages. In such moments, the past 
becomes beautiful, the future a menace. I have a purpose in this frank disclosure of my mother's life. It is not from any self-complacency, God knows, for I did so little and it came so late. I write in the hope of making some other work-weary mother happy. There's nothing more appealing to me than neglected age. To see an old father or mother sitting in loneliness and poverty, dreaming of an absent son who never comes, of a daughter who never writes, is to me more moving than Hamlet or Otello. If we are false to those who gave us birth, we are false indeed. Most of us in America are the children of working people, and the toil-worn hands of our parents should be heaped to overflowing with whatever good things success brings to us. They bent to the plow and the washboard when we were helpless. They clothed us when clothing was bought with blood, and we should be glad to return this warmth, this protection, an hundredfold. Fill their rooms with sunshine and the odor of flowers. You sons and daughters of the pioneers of America, gather them around you. Let them share in your success. And when someone looks askance at them, stand beside them and say, these gray old heads, these gnarled limbs sheltered me in days when I was weak and life was stern. Then will the debt be blessed. For in such coin alone can the wistful hearts be paid. I was pleased when I first came upon this book because in Campbell County we are still living with people who are so much like the pioneers that came here first. And it reminded me of daily life in Campbell County and brings to mind people and events from our past, too. Although my family was not a farming family, in my early life, we had no automobile or television. We had death of a child in the family. And we think of how it changed us all. And yet my mother continued working and working, and her life was, was difficult. Cleaning and cooking and ironing and working and making our clothes. And I think I was not appreciative as a child to having any realistic idea of my mother's life. And my mother and father scrimping and saving for our education. My father made our own toys. He made a swing set for me, and I had a rope hanging from the tree, and I would read books sitting in the branch of a crabapple tree. And we all worked together to can fruits and vegetables from the garden. Reading of our pioneer mother 
reminded me of so many of the stories that my mother and grandmother told about their early lives. And I'm hoping that you were reminded of some of your own stories when I was reading this section. Because now is the time to hear your stories and your response. I'm pointing out, not that you didn't already know it, that this program, Our Bridges, Stories from When, is about all of our stories, your stories, not just mine. I invite you to share a story or letter or moment from your life that you thought about while I was reading this section from the Pioneer Woman. Maybe you thought of a time when something special happened or something happened that you didn't expect no matter how hard you tried. Or maybe you have an older relative who told you some stories of pioneer life. On the last Wednesday of this month, at 8.30 p.m., right here on WLAF Channel 12 in La Follette, we will be sharing the stories that you tell. We have asked a few friends of Postmark to respond, but we always have room for more. The way to get in touch will be on the screen in just a moment. We're very interested in the stories of pioneer life in this area or of hardships that you know of or anything else that you thought of while we were reading from the pioneer mother. The way to <clears throat> get in touch to remind you again will be on the screen in just a moment. Thank you for tuning in. This is Deborah Catherine, looking forward to seeing you next time. And I want to wish you a good night and good memories.